1991, the children's ward at Grantham Hospital found itself in a state of panic. So many children were falling very suddenly and seriously ill. Their hearts were literally stopping out of nowhere. They'd already lost two children to these unexplained attacks and almost lost a further two. But this was only the start of the devastation that would take place while the angel of death was on the job. So today's video is going to be part two of the Beverly Alec case, the angel of death, the nightmare nurse. She goes by so many different names. And if you haven't caught part one, you kind of need to watch that one first before you watch this one. Otherwise this one won't make any sense. I'll link it up here for you so you can go and catch up with that one and then come right back here and we'll carry on with the story. But before we do get into part two, I do just want to thank our sponsors for making this video possible, Castify. For the last like, two years, the only phone cases I have used have been Castify ones. And there's so many reasons for that. They're literally the most protective phone cases I have ever come across. They're all drop tested to different heights, like all the different types of cases. The impact cases are like 6.6 .6 foot drop protected. But my personal favorites are the ultra impact cases, the ones that have these like little bumpers on. These are my favorites and these are drop tested to 9.8 feet. Are you joking? Like, I can't even reach that high. I'll even prove it to you as well. So this is my phone before. No cracks, no scratches. Do you like the slippers, by the way? Anyway. Yeah. And would you look at that? She's fine. The impact and ultra impact cases are made with 65% recycled and plant-based materials. That's actually one of my favorite things about Casetify is how dedicated they are to sustainability. They have a line of compostable cases and also a line of crush cases, which are actually made from recycled old phone cases that people send in. Have a look at the Recasetify program. It's brilliant. But another thing that makes Casetify so unique is the antimicrobial coating that the phone cases have. That means it kills 99.9% .9 of the bacteria that lands on your phone. That's one of those things that you don't know you need, but now you know you need it. The cases come in so many cute designs as well, in like every style, no matter what your aesthetic is, I guarantee you will be able to find a phone case that suits your style on Casetify. They also do personalized phone cases that you can get like your name on or someone else's name or like any word that you want, I suppose, which I think makes a really nice gift, a really thoughtful gift if you got a phone case with your name on. So if you want to grab a Casetify case, they're giving you lucky ducks 15% off when you go through my link, which is casetify.com forward slash Eleanor. The link is down below in the description. The code will be automatically applied at checkout. So thank you very much to Casetify for that wonderful discount and thank you for sponsoring this video. Before we get into the rest of the case, I do just want to give content warnings, although they are the same as part one. So if you couldn't watch part one, you probably won't be able to watch part two. So in this video, we're gonna be discussing the murders of very young children, even babies. Um, we're also gonna be discussing a lot of different mental illnesses, including personality disorders, self-harm, um, anorexia, Munchausen syndrome, Munchausen syndrome by proxy. There's also gonna be brief mentions of animal abuse, rape, and domestic violence. So if any of that is something that you don't wanna hear about right now, I completely understand. Just click out the video and hopefully I'll catch you again with a different video another time. But yeah, all of that being said, I already gave a little bit of a summary at the start of the video, so let's just get straight into part two. So the next child to fall suddenly ill at Grantham Hospital, this happened literally the day after Paul Crampton was transferred out, five-year-old Bradley Gibson was transferred in. He'd been referred to Grantham Hospital by his GP because his mother had taken him to the GP, just the normal doctor, because he had a really bad cough. But once the GP checked him over, he diagnosed him with quite a bad chest infection. And so they sent him to the hospital so that he could be put on like antibiotics. He was put on an IV. And when he arrived at the hospital, all these nurses remarked at how positive and bright little Bradley was. Like, even though he had this really bad chest infection, he was in pain but he was just so smiley and bubbly and happy so yeah Bradley was in good spirits he was fitted with his IV he was taken to his hospital room and he was getting on quite well however in the middle of his first night at the hospital he complained to the nurses that his IV was hurting him um, and so nurse Beverly Allett went to his room to go and sort it out but while she was there Bradley collapsed apparently he just slumped forward in his bed 
went completely unconscious, stopped breathing, and his heart just stopped. So the team rushed in to come and resuscitate Bradley and they were doing everything that they possibly could, but nothing was really working. And so they made the decision to up the doses to adult doses. Bear in mind, this is a five-year-old boy. So this can be quite dangerous, but when nothing else is working, I suppose anything beats losing him. They used the defibrillator on him like seven or eight times, which I don't think you're supposed to do on a five-year-old, but like I said, anything beats losing him. They were upping all his different medications and stuff, and finally, they resuscitated him. He was breathing again. Because this attack had been so sudden, literally came out of nowhere, Grantham Hospital decided to do some tests on Bradley. They took a blood sample, and again, they found those insanely high insulin levels that the Nottingham Hospital had found in another child. But the frustrating part about this is, because Bradley's blood test had been done by Grantham Hospital, and Paul Crampton's blood test, the one before, had been done by Nottingham Hospital, they didn't connect the two. No one was noticing that there was a pattern here with these children falling suddenly ill, having these respiratory attacks and having super high insulin levels. Like no one noticed that because it was two different teams that figured that out and they didn't communicate it. Later that same evening, five-year-old Bradley Gibson went into cardiac arrest again a second time and history repeated itself. Beverly Allett sounded the alarm, rushed to his bedside and helped to resuscitate him. Again, and Bradley was fine. And now that Bradley had had two attacks, Grantham Hospital just felt like they couldn't deal with this case. Just like they couldn't deal with a lot of the cases that they were having lately. And so they transferred Bradley to Nottingham Hospital where he recovered pretty much instantly and never had another cardiac arrest. Fancy that. Although sadly he was left with long lasting issues from these attacks. He couldn't use his legs for a long, long time and he lost control of his bladder for a number of years as well. Fortunately, after years of physiotherapy, Bradley managed to gain all of this back. He could use his legs again. He got control of his bladder, but that didn't stop the kids at school bullying him for all of this. He had a really hard time because of all of these physical issues that he was left with and he even had nightmares for a long time. But he was one of the luckier patients to come off of the children's ward at Grantham Hospital. The next suspicious case that they had was on March 22nd and let me just put this into perspective for you. Beverly Allett has only been working there for one month at this point, and they've had this many suspicious cases. Just every single week, there were new children having these random respiratory attacks, unexplained cardiac arrests, and none of this had ever really happened before until Beverly Allett joined. But anyway, on March 22nd, two-year-old Yik Hung Chan was admitted to the hospital after he fell and fractured his skull. He was put under the care of nurse Beverly Allett, and literally within a few hours of him arriving at the hospital, he stopped breathing and went blue. Completely out of nowhere, just like all of these other children. And so nurses rushed to his bedside, gave him oxygen, and he responded well to that. He actually came around again. But due to the severity of what he already had, a fractured skull, that's why he was in hospital in the first place, Grantham Hospital thought, well, fractured skull plus cardiac arrest out of nowhere, like they could not deal with a case that severe. And so they transferred Yik Hung Chan to Nottingham Hospital. And there he completely recovered. Never had another respiratory attack or cardiac arrest, just like Paul Crampton, just like Bradley Gibson, just like a lot of the children that they transfer hospitals away from Grantham. Nottingham Hospital just attributed this random cardiac arrest to his skull fracture. I don't know what the correlation is, but then again, I'm not a doctor. Um, they just kind of thought, oh, that must be the reason. And no one ever really talked about it again. I don't know how they keep blaming these cardiac arrests, these random respiratory attacks on something different every single time. Like, oh, maybe it's the chest infection or, oh, maybe it's the skull fracture or maybe it's this, maybe it's that. It's like every time these children would have a severe cardiac arrest or respiratory attack, they would just blame it on something quite irrelevant like every single time and it's like, why is no one noticing this pattern? Becky and Katie Phillips were the next two children to fall ill at Grantham Hospital. They were two twins and they were born very premature. So they were tiny, tiny, tiny. And at the point where they were admitted to the hospital, they were just nine weeks old. The first one of the twins to be admitted to the hospital was Becky. She had caught quite a severe stomach bug. She was vomiting, she had diarrhea. And in a nine week old premature baby, this can be so, so dangerous 
dangerous. And so they admitted her to the hospital so that she could have very close care and a close eye on her at all times. And she was responding really well to the treatment. She was getting her fluids up, she'd stopped vomiting and it looked like she was on the mend. However, just a couple of days in, Nurse Beverly Allett raised the alarm that Becky had stopped breathing. She was resuscitated successfully and just like all those other children that were successfully resuscitated, she recovered so fast. It's like these kids bounced back within a few hours, which is not normal when you've got a severe cardiac arrest, especially in a nine week old baby. Yeah, it was almost unbelievable how well she recovered. And so within a few days of this cardiac arrest, Becky was discharged from the hospital. But on the first night in her own home, Becky took a turn for the worst and she started having convulsions and she was in so much pain, bless her. She was sobbing her little eyes out and her parents just did not know what to do. So they called for an emergency doctor to come to the house and this doctor had no relation to Grantham Hospital, it was an independent doctor. They came and they assessed Becky and they told her parents that it seemed she had colic, which is a term for when a newborn baby just cries and cries and cries for no reason. Apparently this is quite a common thing with newborn babies where they're perfectly healthy, they have nothing wrong with them, but they just seem to cry and they never stop. And usually it resolves itself within like a few weeks. So the doctor advised her parents to just try and soothe her, try and comfort her the best that they can and maybe take her for a proper examination the following morning because this was quite late at night when this doctor came out. But the next morning when the parents woke up and went to go and check on their baby, she was cold to the touch. Becky Phillips had passed away in her sleep. And as if this wasn't traumatic enough to lose a child, to lose your baby, her parents were now filled with fear that maybe their other daughter, Becky's twin sister, Katie, what if she'd caught the same thing? What if Becky had kind of passed this stomach bug onto her sister? And what if they were gonna lose their other baby as well now? So the parents rushed Katie to the hospital to be checked over and cared for by professionals. And as soon as they got there, they were greeted by nurse Beverly Allett. And they were just so comforted to see a friendly face, someone that they knew, someone that they trusted on the children's ward. So nurse Beverly Allett took Katie and whisked her away to her own hospital bed where she hooked her up to all these monitors that could check on her, but within just a few hours of arriving at the hospital, Katie stopped breathing. In the space of 24 hours, this family had very suddenly and tragically lost one of their babies, and now their other daughter seems to be falling ill in the exact same way. I can't imagine how terrifying this must have been. Katie was resuscitated successfully, but then she stopped breathing again and she was resuscitated again. And at this point, Grantham were like, nope, this case is too severe. Transferred her to Nottingham Hospital as always for urgent care. As soon as Katie arrived at this new hospital, they gave her a full examination. And that was when doctors found out that five of her ribs were broken. How? They had no idea how this could have happened. Her parents had no idea either because it's not like she'd like fallen or been dropped or anything like that. They couldn't imagine how five of her ribs could have just broken. But the doctors at Nottingham Hospital attributed her lungs collapsing to these broken ribs. It seemed to make these respiratory attacks make sense. This is actually the only case in a while where the respiratory attacks kind of made sense. So once again, no further investigations were done. No one is realizing a pattern or a correlation because they seem to be just blaming these cardiac arrests on something, anything, everything. Everything other than bad care at Grantham Hospital. Katie recovered and survived her ordeal, although she was left with long lasting issues. Due to the oxygen deprivation to her brain, she was actually left with cerebral palsy. And that is a lifelong disability. I think a couple of the children in this case were left with cerebral palsy. That is something that will affect them for the rest of their lives. But she was alive and that's all that matters. Her parents were just over the moon that she could be saved. And they were so grateful for all of the hospital staff help, especially nurse Beverly Allett that had cared for both of their babies now. In fact, the Phillips family were so grateful to nurse Beverly Allett that they actually asked her to be Katie's godmother and she accepted. She was Katie Phillips' 
godmother. After this case of Katie and Becky Phillips, there were four more cases on the Grantham Children's Ward of children's hearts just randomly stopping these random respiratory attacks. And these next four cases don't really have as much information on them. And I'm not entirely sure what order they happened in, but we've done our best. I'll tell you what I know. Also, before I carry on, I know to me and you, true crime fans, it seems insanely obvious that something dodgy is going on here. I keep saying it that, they do that the doctors weren't like spotting these patterns or correlations, but bear in mind, this case actually took place before the Harold Shipman case. If you're unaware of the Harold Shipman case, I've done a full video on it, but um, he was a doctor that was killing a lot of his patients and that hadn't been exposed yet. So it wasn't in people's minds that doctors could be doing this to their patients. It was completely unheard of. We'd never had a case like that in the UK before until Harold Shipman and then until this one. And besides, Nurse Beverly Allett seemed so dedicated to her job that no one ever suspected that she was a bad person. You know, she was volunteering to work outside of hours unpaid just to care for these children. To everyone around her, this just seemed like a passion of hers that she just really wanted to look after children. So anyway, as I was saying, there were four more cases around this time and I'll run through them quickly. One of which was Michael Davidson. I couldn't find out how old Michael was, but Beverly was part-time caring for him. It was her and another doctor that were looking after Michael. And this other doctor had asked nurse Beverly Allett to go and get a syringe, go and prepare a syringe for Michael. So she brought this syringe back to the doctor who administered it to Michael and literally within minutes, his heart stopped so suddenly, so randomly. And luckily they could resuscitate him, but they couldn't figure out why this had happened. And everyone that was on the ward that day all agreed that this was weird, that this wasn't natural, that something odd had happened here. And they did want to look into it. They did want to investigate. But the only thing being, like I said, they were so understaffed on this ward, they simply didn't have time to investigate why this could have happened. They were just so busy with all of these patients that no one had an, a spare hour to go and do tests on this boy and figure out why this happened. They had to be like running around, like looking after all these children. So actually they just concluded that Michael must have been allergic to the medication or something like that. He had an adverse reaction and that must have been the explanation. But really they never actually found out an explanation. Another child named Christopher Peasgood was admitted to the children's ward with a chest infection, just like a lot of children before him. And within a few hours of arriving, he stopped breathing. He stopped breathing twice, actually. He was resuscitated and then stopped again, and then he was resuscitated again. That's another pattern here as well. These cardiac arrests are not just one singular thing. A lot of these children are having repeated attacks. But yeah, he was resuscitated for a second time and he seemed to bounce back fine. And after that, he never had another attack. But there was something else weird about this case. Some of the reports say that there were signs that he'd been smothered, yet that wasn't looked into. What? What do you actually mean? Signs that a child has been smothered, but it wasn't looked into, I believe because they were so understaffed and they didn't have time to look into that. But how serious is that? and they didn't look into it. But yeah, like I said, he never had another attack after those two and he was able to leave the hospital relatively recovered. The next child was named Christopher King and very similarly to Becky Phillips, he had caught this stomach bug. He was vomiting, diarrhea. It was really, really severe. And so he was admitted to the hospital to just try and get his fluids up. He was left under the care of nurse Beverly Allett for a couple of hours, just while his parents were out speaking to the other doctors. And when they returned to his bedside, Christopher was very unwell. Just minutes later, he actually stopped breathing completely and turned blue. But Nurse Beverly Alec was on the case. She rushed to his bedside, managed to resuscitate him, managed to get him pretty much fully recovered. And after that, Christopher King was completely fine. He never suffered anything like that ever again. Doctors just kind of put it down to severe dehydration due to his stomach bug and they moved on. And the last of these four cases was a young boy named Patrick Elstone who also stopped breathing on the children's ward of Grantham Hospital. And it was Beverly Allett that actually noticed that he'd stopped breathing and turned blue because he was hooked up to a load of monitors, but they didn't go off when he stopped breathing for some reason. If it hadn't have been for Beverly Allett noticing that this boy had stopped breathing and gone blue, he would have lost his life. And so when she rushed to his bedside and helped to resuscitate him, his parents were so grateful to her. She had saved 
their boy's life. But the next child on the Grantham Children's Ward sadly wouldn't be so lucky. 15 month old Claire Peck was admitted to the Children's Ward in late April for severe asthma. In fact, she'd had this severe asthma all her life and so she'd been in and out of the Children's Ward all her life. So the staff knew her quite well, but this was the first time she'd been there while nurse Beverly Allett had been working. On April 22nd, doctors pulled Claire's parents into an office just to discuss her treatment plan and they left Claire in the care of nurse Beverly Allett. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Claire went into cardiac arrest. She turned blue and Beverly Allett actually managed to resuscitate her all by herself. She helped this baby recover. And her parents were, of course, so relieved but also so worried that like, where had that come from? Now they were even more scared for their daughter. And so once again, the doctors pulled her parents aside into this office to discuss how and why this might have happened. But within 90 seconds of her parents leaving Claire's bedside, she had collapsed again and stopped breathing again. Beverly tried to resuscitate Claire again, but she couldn't do it. And so she raised the alarm for further help. They rushed to the bedside and they were doing everything that they could, but Claire was just far too weak and they just couldn't bring her round. And it was then when Claire Peck's heart stopped and she was pronounced dead. She passed away with her parents at her bedside. And the nurses remember this being one of the saddest days that they had ever worked. Literally every nurse, every doctor on that ward was sobbing because they all knew Claire quite well at this point. Like I said, she was always in the hospital for her asthma and she had just the most gorgeous little smiling bright face and all the staff loved her. It was like they were all losing a family member. Claire's body was sent off for an autopsy so that they could figure out how this happened, but the coroner just ruled her death as natural causes. And a lot of people were satisfied with that, but not everyone. There was a pediatric consultant at Grantham and Kesteven Hospital named Dr. Porter, and he was alarmed at the amount of just random cardiac arrests and respiratory attacks that had been happening over the last like two months in that hospital. He was actually so concerned that he opened a formal inquiry, thinking that something was going on here. Now, when I say he thought something was going on, he never for one second thought that someone was intentionally hurting these children. He just thought that some like protocols needed changing. Something was going wrong with how the nurses were trying to deal with these children, if that makes sense. Like he didn't think it was quite as sinister as what it was, but he thought that some people might not be doing their jobs properly and it was it was getting quite devastating at this point. So something needed to be done. So he compiled a list of the 13 children that we've spoken about in this case, because they were all very, very similar. Just random cardiac arrests, respiratory attacks out of nowhere. They'd stop breathing, their heart would stop, they'd turn blue. It was all the same. And he went and contacted the authorities, the police. And he basically said, look, I've got no proof of anything, but I just know that something is not right here. Something is going on and I need you to look into this. And police agreed that something didn't seem quite right with those figures and all of the cases that this doctor had told them. And so on May 3rd, 1991, the doctors went down to Grantham and Kesteven Hospital to speak with Dr. Porter and one of his colleagues. And in this meeting, there was another man invited. So there were the doctors from Grantham Hospital, but also a professor named Dr. Hull, who was also a medical professional, but he wasn't linked to Grantham Hospital in any way. They needed like a completely separate perspective, you know? And after this meeting, Dr. Hull took all of this information, all of this evidence that the hospital had given him, and he wrote up a report. And he mainly focused this report on a few of the more concerning cases or the cases that he felt were the most concerning. The main one being the case of Paul Crampton, one of the surviving children. He, he was the one where they found those insanely high insulin levels in his blood and they put it down to an insulinoma but they actually never had any evidence that there was even an insulinoma there. And Professor Hull basically said, if this was down to an insulinoma, it would be a recurring issue. This insulinoma would keep coming back. But like I said, Paul Crampton never had any issues like this ever again. So Professor Hull was basically saying, 
it can't be an insulinoma. So how were his levels that high? That's not natural. Something must have happened to get his levels that high. That was only one of the things that Professor Hull wrote about in this report, but there were so many other concerning, suspicious things that he'd spotted throughout these cases. And when he'd finished this report, he took it back to Grantham and Kesteven Hospital and showed Dr. Porter and they just could not believe that all of this evidence had been like right in front of their eyes the whole time. So they took these reports straight to the police and they were like, look, look at everything that we've found. Isn't this suspicious? And police kind of looked at it and they were like, police thought that these doctors were kind of wasting their time. They didn't take this as seriously as the doctors were taking it because police thought that this was more of a case of bad staffing. Like they thought that the nurses and the doctors at Grantham and Kesteven Hospital were not doing a good enough job and that was what was leading to all of these unexpected child deaths, cardiac arrests, um, respiratory attacks. 12 of them in two months. The police kind of just told these doctors that maybe they should look into training their staff better instead of accusing them of like wrongdoing and intentionally harming these children. But the police did open a formal inquiry because I mean, this is very serious and, and they needed to. In fact, there was one man on the police force, Superintendent Stuart Clifton, and he saw this case for what it was. He saw it exactly how the doctors were. This was so suspicious, something was going on, and Superintendent Stuart Clifton got super passionate about this case. Even though all of his colleagues were telling him he's wasting his time and this investigation's gonna lead to nowhere, he's just wasting police funds. But Stuart Clifton was like, maybe. But what if something is going on and we ignore it because it would waste police time or waste funds? What if something is going on and they're not catching it and children just keep dying and having their lives ruined from these cardiac arrests, these respiratory attacks? He said he wouldn't be able to live with himself if something was going on and they'd all just stood by and done nothing. So he didn't care if he was wasting his time. He was gonna put his all into this investigation. And actually Superintendent Stuart Clifton risked losing his job over this because the other police officers were so against him spending time and money on this. And they'd put in so many complaints about him that he feared that if he did do this investigation, and it was all a misunderstanding and it was actually, you know, unexplained medical phenomenons, then he could lose his job over that. But he was willing to take that chance because he told everyone that he just had a gut feeling that something wasn't right and he needed to trust that. He needed to follow that because children were losing their lives here. So immediately police started working inside the hospital. There was constant police presence on the children ward at Grantham Hospital and this made everyone quite uneasy. The staff, the children, the, their parents. In fact, a lot of the parents of the children in that ward actually threatened to take their children elsewhere because they didn't like the police presence. I mean, it was only Superintendent Stuart Clifton and a couple of other colleagues, but it, it kind of made the environment really tense. As to be expected, police presence will make a situation quite tense, but I mean, no one was really looking at the bigger picture. Maybe it's worth it, it is worth it. So police started their investigation by interviewing every single person that worked on the children's ward at Grantham Hospital. And that's not just doctors and nurses, that's everyone, the cleaners, the admin staff, the student nurses, literally everyone. Anyone and everyone that steps foot on that ward is getting questioned. Beverly Allett was actually one of the first to be questioned because it was all the doctors and nurses that were first. And police remembered her just being very bright and bubbly and she seemed very passionate about her job. She seemed to really care about the children and that was about it, really. And when you think about her past, Beverly Allett had spent her whole entire life lying to everyone. And at this point, now that she's in her 20s, she's good at it. Like, she can lie to anyone and get away with anything. I don't think she was that passionate about this job, but police left that interview thinking, wow, this woman is a saint. She, she loves her job. She loves caring for children. I don't think she did. She just played that role so well and everyone believed her. So as some of the police officers were conducting these interviews, there were other officers that were trying to gather physical evidence, which as I'm sure you can imagine in a case like this, it's very hard to find any physical evidence. Luckily for police though, Grantham Hospital still had a few frozen blood samples from nine 
of the children that were involved in this inquiry, which they actually shouldn't have had. That's kind of naughty. They were supposed to get rid of those blood samples every every now and again, they're supposed to just clear out the blood samples. But because the ward was so understaffed, they didn't have enough people for the amount of jobs that they had, they just weren't getting around to a lot of the jobs. So to be fair, sometimes it helps to be a bit unorganized. And now police had physical evidence when they weren't expecting to get any actually. So they sent all of these samples off to a hospital in Surrey. They wanted to send them quite far away from Grantham or Nottingham because they didn't want to risk, I don't know, they just wanted a complete different perspective of a hospital that is in no way connected or linked to Grantham or Nottingham or any in the area. So yeah, all these samples were sent off to Surrey and actually one of these nine samples belonged to Paul Crampton. You remember the boy that had those insanely high insulin levels, he supposedly had an insulinoma, but did he really? This was the case that Professor Hull was the most concerned about because when Paul Crampton went to Nottingham Hospital, his blood test revealed that his insulin level was at 500 and the average for a boy his age is between 10 and 15. 500. And now they had a blood sample of Paul Crampton's from when he was in Grantham Hospital that they could test against the Nottingham Hospital blood sample. So the hospital in Surrey has it, they analyze it, and they send those results back to the police. And you're not gonna believe this. The insulin levels in Paul Crampton's blood while he was in Grantham Hospital were at 47,000. Let me remind you, the average for a boy his age, 10 to 15, 47,000. That's actually the second highest insulin level ever recorded. And this is a five-year-old boy. The doctors at Nottingham Hospital had thought that that 500 insulin level reading was an anomaly and that it was false, it was a false reading. But now that they had this one from Grantham to compare it to, they knew that it wasn't false and that this boy had insanely, unnaturally high insulin levels. So police actually wanted to figure out how Paul Crampton's insulin levels had gone from 47,000 at Grantham Hospital to 500 at Nottingham the very next day. How had that been such a drastic drop in less than 24 hours? So police looked into this and they actually found that the equipment used at Nottingham Hospital to test his blood sample only went up to 500. So that meant that his insulin level could have been over 500, but this machine can't, can't say that. All it can say is 500. So it's more than likely that Paul Crampton's levels would have still been in the tens of thousands when he was at Nottingham Hospital, but that machine just had no way of reading that high. So now police are questioning how and why this could have happened. This is a five-year-old boy with the second highest insulin level ever recorded. Something's not right. Something is not right. Police feared that someone in that hospital, one of the staff members, could have been intentionally overdosing these children with insulin, trying to give them an insulin overdose. And so they started researching the concept of insulin overdose just as a thing. They just started researching it online. And that was when they stumbled across a medical report that detailed two separate cases of insulin overdose that had happened as a result of Munchausen by proxy. And this is essentially what Beverly Allett had, you know, Munchausen syndrome. It's where you make yourself ill or hurt yourself for sympathy or attention. Now the by proxy bit means that you're not doing that to yourself, you're doing that to someone else. You're hurting or harming someone else for that attention or sympathy. It's like if you've ever heard the case of Dee Dee Blanchard before, I feel like a lot of people have, if you've ever watched The Act, was that on Hulu? Um, very similar thing there. Or if you've ever seen It, you know, the kid Eddie, his mom had Munchausen syndrome by proxy and she like gave him all these medications to make him ill, even though he wasn't ill. But anyway, I'm getting off track there talking about It. Um, back to the, the medical report. Both of these cases that were detailed in the medical report of insulin overdose were actually from mothers intentionally injecting their daughters with insulin trying to make them overdose on it. And for these mothers, it was all about attention and sympathy, sometimes even financial gain. And police read this report and they feared that someone at the Grantham Hospital was doing this, this exact thing, 
to their patients. So with this in mind, police went back to the Grantham Hospital and they started asking the staff about their drug protocols. You know, where do they store the insulin? How is it administered? They wanted to know everything about how it's done. But the police were informed that all of their insulin was kept in this one big fridge that had a big lock on it. However, the key for that lock had been missing for months. And so the fridge had just remained unlocked for months. And the last person that was known to have that key to the fridge, I feel like you've already guessed it, it was Nurse Beverly Allett. She was the last person recorded to have that key. She claimed that at the end of her shift, when she had the key, she said she handed it over to the nurse on the next shift after her. However, that next nurse said, nah, she never handed me anything. She never gave me anything. So Nurse Beverly Allett was the last person to ever have that. I don't know why they didn't look into that at the hospital, probably the understaffing issue. Again, they don't have time to investigate anything, I suppose, at this hospital, which is very dangerous. When such suspicious things are happening left, right and centre, I feel like maybe it's time to hire more people. So as soon as police heard this, that Beverly Allett had that key, probably, I mean, there's no evidence to say that she did, but like, come on. And the insulin fridge had just stayed open and accessible to anyone at any time for the last two months. This was just consolidating their theory more and more that maybe Beverly was intentionally overdosing these children. So at this point, police got in touch with Surrey Hospital who still had all the samples, they were still doing the tests and they were like, can you get a shift on with this? Like, can you do this a bit quicker? Because it's looking really scary on our end. And so Surrey did all the tests pretty much the same day, sent the results back to the police. And what do you know? Every single one of those samples from Grantham Hospital had sky high insulin levels. Every single one of these children that had, you know, unexpected cardiac arrests or respiratory attacks, they all had something in common, these insanely high insulin levels. In fact, actually not all of them were insulin levels, but all of these children had insanely high levels of something. Most often it was insulin, but some of the others were like other injectable drugs. Becky Phillips, you know, the nine week old premature baby that died, her blood sample read 9,000 units of insulin, a nine week old premature baby as well. Whereas the most recent death of baby Claire Peck, her blood sample came back and read an insanely high level of a drug named lignocaine, which is a cardiac drug that is never given to children and it was given to a 15 month old baby. And as soon as police saw all of this evidence come back from Surrey, they knew that they were right, that someone in that hospital had to be intentionally injecting these children, trying to make them overdose, trying to make them ill, even trying to kill them. So with all of this information, police started to compare all the data that they had for all these different 13 children, all these 13 cases. And they realized that all of them had one thing in common, and that was that nurse Beverly Allett was working on the day that these children all had their attacks. In fact, she'd only started working there at the children's ward two days before the first attack. So she arrives two days later, all these children start falling suddenly and severely ill. Their heart's stopping, they're stopping breathing, they're turning blue as soon as Beverly Allett arrives. And with that, she was the prime suspect in this case and police knew they needed to act quickly in order to save any other children on that ward. So that same day, security cameras were installed all over the children's ward. All of the parents of all of these 13 cases, they were all interviewed and mainly asked about Beverly Allett actually, because they wanted to see how she'd been interacting with people. Police went and checked all of the children's records again, a double check actually, because I think they'd checked them before, but this time they found that Paul Crampton's records were missing. And that was the main case that police and Professor Hull were the most concerned about. So could it be that someone had stolen these records or destroyed them or tried to get rid of them somehow. Physical evidence was really, really hard to come by in this case, like we've said. I mean, especially because this is a hospital as well, one of the most sanitized places on earth. So police really had to rely more on like circumstantial evidence and witness testimonies and interviews and things like that. And now that they'd identified their prime suspect, Beverly Allett, they could come at this from another angle and they started to look 
into Beverly as a person to see if there were any clues in her life, you know, that could link to this case at all. And that was when they found that she had Munchausen syndrome. And as soon as police found that out, they just knew they had the right person. They knew it. She was doing the same thing that she'd always done to herself for years and years and years. But when that stopped getting her attention, she'd start doing it to other people. She was harming other people now. It seemed that her Munchausen syndrome had developed into Munchausen syndrome by proxy. So on May 21st, 1991, police turned up at Beverly Allett's house at 7 a.m. to arrest her. Although they had to be careful what they actually arrested her for, because like I said, they really didn't have like any evidence at this point. I mean, they had evidence that the children were not dying naturally, but they didn't have any evidence that Beverly herself was the one doing it. So they actually had to arrest her for stealing the insulin fridge key and the attempted murder of Paul Crampton. They were the only things that they actually had evidence for, but they managed to arrest her and they took her to the police station for an interview. But to be honest, she was just so chill about the whole thing. Like not like in a, oh, I don't care kind of way, but more in a, I don't know, she just wasn't anxious, she wasn't worried. She was more playing this um, caring nurse role as she always had. She was acting like she wanted to do this interview to help the police solve this case, you know? She was still telling them how passionate she was about her job and how much she loved it and how much she loved caring for people and she loved her patients and all that kind of stuff. And this whole situation was just really odd, no matter what way you looked at it, because if she was guilty and she was trying to kill all of these children, she had been doing this on purpose, then she was a scarily convincing liar. She was good at lying. But alternatively, if she was innocent and she wasn't lying and she was just this great nurse, then why didn't she care more about being accused of murdering her patients that she so loved? apparently, according to her. I don't know, I think if I was a nurse and I was so passionate about my job and someone accused me of intentionally harming my patients, I would be so offended, so offended. But she didn't seem bothered that she was being accused of this. Hmm. So as Beverly was being interviewed at the police station, other police officers were sent to her house to perform a full search and they found some damning evidence in her house. They found Paul Crampton's missing records that seemed to have been stolen from the hospital in Beverly's home and right next to them, a syringe. Was she keeping these things as mementos of what she'd done to that poor five-year-old boy? So police decided that the next thing they should do is bring in a psychiatrist to assess Beverly Allett in the police station because obviously their main theory involved her having a very serious mental illness. So they needed to get like a diagnosis. They needed confirmation that she had Munchausen syndrome or Munchausen syndrome by proxy. So the psychiatrist came in and spoke with Beverly and immediately, yeah, she had Munchausen's. And they pinpointed the development of her Munchausen syndrome to be right when she got rejected from grammar school. Do you remember her parents really wanted her to go to this prestigious school and her sister had gotten into that school but Beverly couldn't, she didn't pass the test to get in. She felt inferior to her intelligent older sister and it's believed that from that point on, she felt she needed to do other things to get her parents' attention. And that was when she developed Munchausen's and started harming herself to try and get sympathy from her parents. And it did work at first, we know it did. People gave her sympathy for putting random bandages on and plasters. But after a while that didn't work. So she had to up the levels. And at that point she was getting like her appendix taken out. She was picking at her wounds, trying to infect her wounds. Like it got to another level, but then that stopped working as well. The psychiatrist believed that her Munchausen syndrome turned into Munchausen syndrome by proxy around the time that she started actually working at the hospital. Cause like I said, she had like 160 sick days in a year. And the hospital were like, you can't do that. You can't do that in a job. We don't want you to work at the hospital if you're gonna be having that much time off. And all of a sudden, her Munchausen's was affecting her life. And actually being off work so much was having the adverse effect to what she really wanted. She wanted attention. She wanted people to love her and, and empathize with her and you know care for her. But people were starting to not like her now because she's having too much time off work. So, all of a sudden, this isn't working. She needs to figure out a new way to get attention and sympathy. And that was when she realized that she could 
intentionally harm her patients and then as nurse Beverly Allett, she could swoop in and save them and save the day and save their lives and be a hero. Their parents would love her. Everyone on the ward would love her. She would finally get that attention that she wanted. All she needed to do was to make sure that she was around when these children fell ill so that she could be the one to treat them. And the way that she did that was by making them ill herself. So it wasn't exactly sympathy that she was doing it for anymore. It was more like praise, but that was good enough. That worked. That was a good enough substitute for her. And it's just sickening that this plan actually worked. Time and time again, it worked. And especially, oh, the case of Katie and Becky Phillips, those premature twins, that case just absolutely boils my blood. Beverly Allett murdered one of those babies and severely disabled another within the space of a few days. And both times those poor girl's parents praised Beverly Allett, thanked her for helping their daughters, and actually they adored her so much for all that she'd done for their daughters that they made her Katie's godmother. My heart just absolutely breaks for the Phillips family. Imagine finding out that you had made your daughter's murderer and your other daughter's attempted murderer a part of your family out of the good of your heart. I think I got a little bit off track there, but we were talking about the psychiatrist evaluation of her. Um, and this psychiatrist actually noted on file that Beverly had a lot of symptoms that were in line with a personality disorder. Now, I don't think they actually named any specific personality disorder. And I don't know if she was actually diagnosed with one, but they basically said that it was probably this personality disorder or these symptoms that are in line with a personality disorder that allowed her to do this for so long because she just didn't really realize the gravity of the situation. Her Munchausen's and this personality disorder, once they were together, that's what led to this absolute disaster. Because people can have Munchausen's and people can have personality disorders and, you know, never do anything like this. But the psychiatrist believed that both of these things together is what led to this. So very early on in this investigation, it was very clear to police that they weren't going to get any confessions out of Beverly. She, she wasn't going to admit to anything. They knew that they needed other evidence. But like I said, physical evidence is just so hard to get in a case like this. And actually they were running out of time because like I said, they'd arrested Beverly on a couple of charges, but they're only actually allowed to keep her in the police station for what is it like 72 hours, three days. So it was coming to the end of that. And if they can't charge her with anything at the end of 72 hours, they have to let her go. That's just the rules. And actually that time came and police just didn't have the physical evidence to be able to charge her with anything and they had to let her go. So Beverly Allett left the police station and by the time she got home, her house was swarming with journalists and photographers, people wanting to see this woman because everyone kind of knew that this case was going on. This case had become huge in the public eye over the last few days. And actually the day that Beverly left the police station, Grantham and Stephen Hospital put out a statement saying that she'd been put on leave pending the results of this investigation. So she'd been suspended from her job. And this actually sparked a lot of interesting responses. A lot of people felt that this was the right thing to do. This was the appropriate thing to do in a situation like this but a lot of people also didn't. Most of those people actually being Beverly's victim's parents who came forward in her defense saying, oh, she must have been framed. She's innocent. Someone must be framing her. Like they were just convinced. The parents didn't doubt that their children were attacked or harmed or even murdered by a member of staff at that hospital. And they were still heartbroken, devastated, angry that someone had done that to their child but they didn't think it was Beverly. They thought that another member of staff on that ward had been doing this to the children and then they tried to frame Beverly for it. To be honest, a lot of them thought that it was the police's fault and that they knew that someone on that ward was killing children and they couldn't figure out who it was and so they just arrested Beverly so that they could say that they had someone for it. You know what I mean? One family actually went so far as to hire a private investigator because they believed Beverly was innocent. They hired this investigator to look into the police investigation of Beverly and try and figure out if anything was like faked or staged or if Beverly was framed. And if that doesn't show how much of a sickeningly good liar 
and manipulator Beverly Allick was, she'd fooled the whole entire world, including the parents of her murder victims. So anyway, like I said, Beverly Allick is released from the police station and she goes back to her house that is absolutely swarming with press, so much so that she can't live there. She can't stay in that house. And so she moved in with her friend named Tracy Jobson. Tracy actually lived with her mother, Eileen, and her brother, Jonathan. So Beverly's moving into like this family home. And of course she's not working at this point. And as soon as she stopped working at that hospital, the cardiac arrest just stopped. But weird goings on seem to follow Beverly Allett wherever she goes. If she's at the hospital, they're at the hospital. But when she's not there anymore, they follow her to her friend's house. And weird things started happening at Tracy's house now, mainly involving her brother, Jonathan. One day, Jonathan walked into his bedroom and found that there'd been bleach poured all over his bed and no one admitted to it. And there was another incident actually with the family dog where they came home one day and they found this poor dog rolling around uncontrollably. It was frothing at the mouth. They had to race it to the vet. The vet determined that the dog must have ingested a large amount of pills and they knew exactly what kind of pill as well. It was a pill that had been prescribed to Eileen that she kept on the top shelf in the bathroom. Somewhere the dog could have never gotten to on its own. Eileen was immediately suspicious of Beverly Allett because they all knew why she was being looked into by the police. They all knew that she had Munchausen syndrome, Munchausen syndrome by proxy. They knew the kind of shit that she got up to. And so Eileen got home from the vet that day and she pulled her daughter and her son into a room, Tracy and Jonathan, and she was like, look, please tell me that neither of you guys left my pills out on the side. Both of them said, no, obviously not. Why would we get your pills from the top drawer and just leave them out on the side for the dog to have? This had never happened before, ever. And that left only one other person in that house that could have done this. And so Eileen went and confronted Beverly Allett and she gave the most insane cover story you have ever heard. You're gonna love this. Beverly said that she had seen a poltergeist in the house, an evil spirit moving things around, picking things up, opening cupboards and just causing general havoc in the house. And so she said, oh, it must have been, it must have been the poltergeist that got your medication out and fed it to the dog. And the family just could not <laughs> believe their ears as Beverly was saying this. I mean, like, what do you say to that? Cause it's obviously a lie. But how did, I don't even know how they would have reacted to that. But anyway, in the following days, some more weird little things kept happening around the house until Jonathan was hospitalized. The whole family and Beverly Allett had all been out at a local market that day. They'd just been walking around, shopping, whatever. And Jonathan had kept complaining all day that he didn't feel well, he wasn't feeling good. And then all of a sudden he collapsed in the middle of the street and they had to phone an ambulance and rush him to hospital. So doctors checked him over, they examined him, they did loads of tests and swabs and samples and they determined that he was having a hypoglycemic attack. His insulin levels were insanely high. And it turned out that right before they'd all left for the market that day, Beverly and Jonathan had been home alone and Beverly had offered to make Jonathan a drink and he accepted. So she brought him this like uh, blackcurrant squash, like the dilute juice, and Jonathan drank it all. And he remembered thinking at the time that it tasted weird but he drank it anyway. And no wonder it tasted weird because Beverly Allett had poisoned it with insulin. And as soon as the family found this out, Eileen was on the phone to the police telling them that she had struck again. And Beverly had actually shot herself in the foot here because the fact that she had acted the exact same in a different environment, the fact that these insulin poisonings seemed to follow her around was enough evidence for police to arrest her and have evidence that she'd done all of the insulin poisonings. This pretty much proved that it couldn't have been anyone else on the children's ward poisoning the kids and then framing Beverly Allett for it because she was still doing it wherever she was. So in November of 1991, literally the same year that she started her job at that hospital, Beverly Allett was charged with four counts of murder eight counts of attempted murder and one count of GBH, grievous bodily harm. So now she was brought into the police station and interviewed again, but this time she was completely different. It was like she just dropped that persona that she was putting on before, that she was a caring, loving, passionate nurse. And now she was just cold, 
emotionless. Now she was like, oh, I don't care about this. In Beverly's first court appearance, she pled not guilty. And so a trial was set for 15 months time after that. And through that 15 months, as they awaited for the trial, Beverly's mental health just seemed to get worse and worse and worse. She actually developed anorexia and lost 70 pounds, which is 31 kilograms. And she was in a really bad way, so much so that the trial actually had to be postponed like further than 15 months so that they could get her physical health back on track before they went ahead with it. Finally, in 1993, Beverly Allitt's trial began. And if this isn't the most Beverly Allitt thing you've ever heard, she actually only attended like half of her trial because she was ill for half of it. She was throwing sickies on her own murder trial, just like she had everything else in her whole entire life. The trial was two months long in total, and of that two months, Beverly Allitt attended 16 days of her own trial. The prosecution presented all of the evidence that we've already talked about throughout these two videos, but they also brought up some very interesting points. Remember how in the case of Katie Phillips, the six week old premature baby, they found that six of her ribs, her tiny little ribs were broken. And that was completely unexplained. Her parents had no idea how her ribs could be broken. And also there was the case of Christopher Peasgood where there were signs that he'd been smothered and that was never looked into. It seemed that Beverly was doing more than just injecting these kids with insulin and trying to make them overdose. She was abusing them as well. It seemed that she just enjoyed harming these innocent children. She was cold and calculated and evil. She wanted to see these children, these babies in pain. And the most horrifying part of all of this is that persona that she would put on for the victim's parents as if she hadn't just been breaking six of their child's ribs in a different room. She would come out and she would be that amazing, bright, smiley, comforting nurse that they all thought she was. So much so that they would make her the godmother of the child whose ribs she just broke. And also remember, there's been a few points throughout this case where these children would stop breathing, but the monitors wouldn't go off. They wouldn't alert that the child had stopped breathing. And I feel like you probably already know why. It's because Beverly Allitt would switch off those monitors so that you know, the children wouldn't be saved. It was also found that when these kids would be given oxygen, you know, when they're being resuscitated by the rest of the team, Beverly would secretly pinch the oxygen tubes to stop the flow of oxygen to the children. And actually it wasn't just while the kids were being resuscitated, because remember a lot of the kids on the children's ward were there for things like chest infections and asthma. They just needed oxygen in general. A lot of them were just constantly hooked up and she would just go in their rooms and pinch the oxygen tubes so that these kids wouldn't be getting the air. Oh my God. She knew what she was doing at every point here. She was so calculated. And I just can't believe the front that she would put on for everyone all the time. Even the police, when they first interviewed her, they thought she was an amazing nurse. Everyone did. One rather interesting thing that was brought up in court, and I wanna give a trigger warning for the anorexia stuff here, because I feel like this could upset some people. So maybe skip forward a little bit if that might affect you. But the psychiatrist suggested in court that maybe Beverly had intentionally developed anorexia as a manifestation of her Munchausen syndrome because she wasn't getting attention from anything anymore. No one was giving her attention for anything. And that was kind of the only thing that she was able to control all her life is her health and how other people responded to it. That was the only way she knew to get attention when she craved it was by hurting herself. And so this psychiatrist said that maybe she did this intentionally. But I do just want to clarify that anorexia is a mental illness. People don't just choose to develop that intentionally, which is why I felt the trigger warning was necessary because this is a very unique um, case here. She was genuinely really physically and mentally unwell with her anorexia. That's not up for debate. She was struggling with it. However, the psychiatrist was suggesting how it might have possibly come about in the first place. The psychiatrist actually ended his statement in court by saying that Beverly Allitt was so severely mentally ill that he didn't think that she could ever be cured. 
and she would be a danger to everyone that she would come in contact with for the rest of her life. At the end of her trial, Beverly Allett was found guilty on all counts. In the space of just 59 days, 22-year-old Beverly Allett had murdered four children and attempted to murder another nine. For that, she was given 13 life sentences and she's actually been placed on a list of criminals that will never be released from prison for public safety reasons. At the time, Beverly Allett's sentence was actually the strictest sentence ever given to a woman in the UK. And it's actually only been beaten by two women since that, Rose West and Joanna Dennehy. Due to her mental illness, Beverly Allett was actually detained under the Mental Health Act and she was sent to Rampton Secure Hospital instead of a prison. And Rampton Hospital is very similar to Broadmoor. You've heard me talk about Broadmoor so many times on this channel. A very secure, like, maximum security psychiatric hospital for the criminally insane. They're filled with like some of the worst criminals in the whole entire country. We're talking murderers, serial killers, rapists, all the worst of the worst. Some notorious patients of Rampton Secure Hospital include Ian Huntley, the man that murdered Holly and Jessica, the Soham murders. There was Stephen Griffiths, the crossbow cannibal. We've covered that case on this channel before as well. A guy called Peter Bryan, who was a cannibal serial killer. And also the guy that tried to kidnap Prince Anne. What was his name? Ian Ball, Ian Ball. Did I say Prince Anne? Princess Anne. So anyway, Beverly Allett was sent to Rampton Secure Hospital and just because she was in there doesn't mean the Munchausen syndrome just turns off. She was still doing stuff in there, like pouring boiling water on herself and stuff. And oh my God, okay, one of the worst things she did, squeamish warning here, just in case. She actually ground up loads of broken glass, like ground it right into a powder and then put that in a syringe, don't know how she got hold of a syringe in this hospital, and injected herself with it. All for attention all for sympathy. She got nothing else out of doing that to herself other than attention and a lot of pain. Following this case, the children's ward at Grantham and Kesteven Hospital has been completely shut down. They no longer have a children's ward just because of the horrendous memories and connotations that would go alongside that. They just didn't want to keep operating after what happened. They didn't want a children's ward after everything that that everyone had been through and all of the staff that were on the children's ward were sent to different departments. They didn't just lose their job, don't worry. Beverly has since admitted to three out of the four murders and six of the other attacks, but she claims no responsibility for the other ones. But even though she does admit to those things now, she's still not showing remorse. She's still not sorry. She's never apologized to anyone, to the victim's parents, to, to no one. She doesn't care. She doesn't care what she did. She's a cold, calculated, evil woman. But that is all we have for this case. Thank you so, so much for watching. And thanks again to Casetify for sponsoring this video. Remember, you can go to casetify.com forward slash Eleanor for 15% off your order. The discount will be automatically applied at checkout. A huge thank you to all of my channel members for supporting the channel and helping me decide the cases that I cover. All of my tier two members are on screen right now. So thank you so much. If you wanna become a channel member, you can click the join button down below. But yeah, thank you so, so much for watching. If you enjoyed, please leave a thumbs up on the video. And if you want to watch another one, I'll leave you one right here. Or if you want to subscribe to my channel because I upload new content all the time, you can click this circle. Thanks. Bye.